Hello, this is Dan Farisi, Editor-in-Chief with Commercial Integrator, welcoming you to AV Plus, the podcast for the commercial AV integration industry. We're continuing once again our series of 40 Influencers Under 40 Class of 2022 podcasts this week. We're happy to be joined by Andrew Gross, who is VP of Sales with Excite, Cassie Wells, who is Corporate Sales Manager with CCS Presentation Systems, and Jenny Hicks, who is Group Head of Technology with Midwich Group. As always, this will be a wide ranging and really interesting conversation with some of our industry's most important and most well-recognized influencers. Thank you for joining us on AV+. I think you'll really enjoy this week's podcast. As always, please like and subscribe to our YouTube page and please subscribe to the AV Plus podcast on Apple and on Spotify. So happy to be continuing this series of AV Plus podcasts with the 40 influencers under 40. We have a great trio of 40 under 40 representatives here with us today. Andrew Gross, VP of Sales with Excite. Cassie Wells, Corporate Sales Manager with CCS Presentation Systems. And Jenny Hicks, Group Head of Technology with Midwich Group. Thank you so much, all three of you, for being here today. And congratulations once again on being 40 influencers under 40 nominees. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. So let's get right into it. Those AV Plus podcast uh, listeners and viewers who have been part of this series so far know that we always start by giving each of our honorees an opportunity to talk a little bit about their career trajectory, what has brought them to this point, and then we move into more of an open-ended conversation. So let's get started with those biographical details. Uh, Andrew, in a couple of minutes, why don't you share a little bit about the career trajectory you have followed and kind of uh, you know how you have become a- an influencer in your early 30s, recognized by peers and colleagues who nominated you to be one of the 40 under 40. Sure thing. Thanks, Dan. And again, it's an honor to be part of this and obviously to be uh, represented in this entire group of incredible influencers and individuals. To be honest, I never really considered myself an influencer until this whole thing came out. But I got to say, it is truly humbling to be a part of this whole group. Um, quick background on myself, it's, it's not very long and, and historic, I guess that's the part of being uh, 40 under 40. But the, my entire professional career was really built at uh, Crestron Electronics. I started my career there right out of uh, college as an engineer. I started working within the group under Fred Bargetsy, building out the lighting control and energy management division, developing a lot of their sensor technology, and then moved from there into some market development roles and training roles, and then uh, finally into uh, sales positions at Crestron. And really, actually, over the last uh, three years at Crestron has been the biggest focus of uh, building out their collaboration business, uh, launching the Crestron Flex business, uh, and then most recently, right before I left Crestron, uh, was actually building and running their global enterprise sales division. But since then, uh, the beginning of this year in 2022, I left Crestron to join a really new and exciting company called Excite, uh, which is based out of Tel Aviv, and to open up their U.S. headquarters here where I am in New Jersey. And the reason why I, I left Crestron to join Excite was really nothing to do with, uh, with Crestron, but actually had something to do more with where the industry as a whole was headed. And I saw an incredible opportunity to jump on ship of a company and help bring them further into an industry that I felt uh, really needed a lot of guidance within the cloudification, the serviceitization, um, and really the, the overall uh, hardware as a service style of going to market strategy. And that's what Excite is all about. And so now here at Excite, I run their global sales division, uh, really building out their office here in the US and in the future, building out their team in Europe and in Asia as well. Thank you so much for that, Andrew. And, and there's no question that Excite has been getting a lot of attention lately. And, uh, you know, it, it's attracted some powerful and respected uh, industry members, yourself included. And uh, clearly it's on a trajectory where it's going to become more and more of an influential name. So thank you so much for sharing a bit about that background and what brought you to Excite. Uh, now let's move to Cassie, uh, who is, again, Cassie Wells, Corporate Sales Manager with CCS Presentation Systems. Uh, tell me a little bit about what brought you to that role, Cassie, what brought you to CCS Presentation Systems, and more broadly, what brought you into the commercial AV industry? And, and finally, and this is obviously a multi-part question, why you're, you're continuing to be excited to be part of this industry? What keeps you motivated and keeps you going? 
Okay, so I had a pretty unique start in this industry. I actually met my current VP of sales, Abe Assad, at an ASU career fair through the business school. And it couldn't have started in a stranger way. He was just arms folded at the table and said, uh, you know, why do you want to be an AV? And luckily, my mother was a teacher at the time. She's now retired. And I was able to, you know, tell him what I knew about AV. Hey, I know about smart boards. I know about this. I know about that. But really not a ton. And um, I was I was lucky enough that he took a chance on me and said, you know what? I'm going to I'm going to train you as a clean slate in um, AV sales. So I learned everything AV. I learned everything sales. Um, I had a, a very fun, successful um, first six years at the company. And I actually took uh, three years and um, had a couple babies and stayed at home with them and worked part-time. CCS allowed me to work part-time while I was raising my kids. And when it was time to come back to work, uh, my VP of sales offered me the corporate sales manager position. And I am extremely grateful for that. So I've, I've now been here um, over 10 years and I absolutely love it. Um, as far, And I'm currently managing a team of um, seven, six corporate reps and a director of business development and together her and I have launched a new kind of a unique way um, of bringing in new business that CCS had never done before and so um, that's something that's very exciting to us and it seems to be working so we're going to keep doing what we're doing and the AV industry it's just so much fun there's so much history there it's ever changing um, you never get stagnant the solutions are fun the new people that are coming in as manufacturers and new technology. It's just never a dull day. Um, every single day is different with different clients, different technology. And that's honestly like what makes it so much fun. Very well put, Cassie. I feel the same way. I've been in the industry in various forms and functions for about 18 years. And really, you know, whether it's an Infocom show or a CDA show, whatever it is, one show is never like the next. The technology is constantly evolving. The user needs are constantly evolving. Integrators' business models and how they remain profitable, all those are constantly evolving. So uh, it's an industry that really is the, F, the exact opposite of stagnancy. So many trades and fields, you hardly see any innovation, you hardly see any change. Change, but in our industry, we're really fortunate to say that one day is never like the next, and, and that's an exciting thing. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> so last, but certainly not least, let's go to you, Jenny, Group Head of Technology with Midwich Group. Uh, same question that I asked Andrew and Cassie, essentially, what brought you to the commercial AV industry and Midwich Group particularly? A little bit about your career trajectory, and also a little bit about what continues to ignite your passion to be part of this industry community, part of the technology that we deliver, and part of this uh, part of this list. Sure. So, um, I never meant to be here, um, <laughs> but I've been here 15 years, so <laughs> something's gone right. Um, I took the first interview from a recruitment agency um, in the UK for my first salary job fresh out of university. Um, I didn't care what it was going to be. It just needed to not be a zero hours contract with um, hourly rate. It happened to be uh, a purchasing admin role at Sahara, who make the Clever Touch boards. Um, and I was there with them for nearly six years. Um, I moved to sales really because the guys upstairs at the time, they were constantly running incentives from various different brands. They were winning prizes. They got to go on trips. And I was like, I, I want a piece of that. And once I got up uh, into the sales team in a new business role, uh, cut my teeth up there, I realized I love the technology. So um, I loved working for those guys. I loved working in education, um, went out on the road and you know that's where my career really started. But um, you can't help but see AV once you're in AV and when you start to see AV in the live event space and museum and leisure, um, I just found that all far too interesting and I wanted to work for a business that was going to get me involved in those sorts of projects. So um, I sat back for a while and I joined the Midwich Group with one of their uh, only then recently acquired businesses, True Colors, um, at the time as an IP video specialist. From there, I went on to manage that category, from that category to managing the team, managing that team to managing the tech specialists, um, by which point I decided I was definitely tech, not sales or the hybrid, I guess, of the two. Um, 
I too went off and had a baby, came back and then stepped into an international role, which is the role I'm still doing today as group head of technology. Um, and yeah, I've, I've, I've been fortunate enough to give a couple of talks internally and have some customers say, could you come and do that for us? Um, which has gradually sort of moved me into uh, or moved more of my role into trends analysis for our own business and externally. That's then uh, introduced me into Avixir and, and other think tanks that I participate in. Um, and obviously, most recently, with the acquisition of Starin, uh, myself and Chris Netto have, have begun our own live show, which has been great fun as well. And, and um, I guess being on this list was really great for me to to have a non UK based publication um, recognize me and and to be nominated to so that was great so why I'm still here it's ever changing um, I love the tech I think if you love the tech that's it you are you you're in and you're you're in for good absolutely the technology I was talking about some of the trade shows we go to we've gone to a moment ago and to walk on that show floor whether it's audio technology video technology it's just it, it's captivating so now that we've kind of situated ourselves understood a little bit more about the paths you've respectively followed what has brought you to this point I'd like to move into more of an open-ended kind of a discussion I'm not sure how uh involved you are with like AB tweets on Twitter, for example. I think I've seen you on there, Jenny. Um, but as, as you probably know, there has been some dialogue, some discussion, some debate about things like the 40 under 40, about the idea of recognizing young influencers as such, rather than saying we're just going to have a list of 50 people who are making a mark on the industry. I'd like to know your perspective on the importance of, if you do believe it's important, recognizing the younger generation. And if you do concur that it's something worthwhile to do, why do you think it's worthwhile to do? And this is an open question for everybody and, and feel free to disagree and bat it a, a around among yourselves. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll take one quick jab at it. Um, I, I think Dan in general, I think it's important to highlight any small grouping of individuals that are performing at a high level, right? I, I don't think it's a matter of, oh, we're only gonna focus on a, a certain age group or a certain minority group or racial group or religious group. Like it's, you know, you, you can say that about almost anything in any industry and especially in the news of whether or not you're going to focus on them, but it's a matter of actually bringing to light or shining a spotlight on people that are part of a group uh, that are performing very well. And, and typically the reason why that's done is because it's meant to influence and meant to inspire others that can then relate to that specific group. And if you simply shine a spotlight on the entire, uh, the entirety of an overall organization, it becomes very difficult to find something that other people can relate to. And so as such an important industry for the future of uh, business and the future of, of really just the future of work, if you're able to take a smaller, more focused approach to shining a spotlight on people that are doing good for the industry and for others that then benefit from that industry, then you're going to influence those to help drive that industry forward, that feel that sense of relation to it, that maybe are outside of the industry, but then feel a sense of comfort by knowing, hey, that person looks like me, they talk like me, uh, I, I can find similarities, maybe I should find out more about that company, that industry, and then ideally move it forward. But that's my initial thought of it is I think it always helps whenever you can find relations amongst each other. I totally I, agree. I think I, I think the difficulty well. with with this has been um, the fact that the age is referenced. But actually, when you think about it, 40 is a great number to be able to showcase a, a good number of people. And in the majority of cases, um, those under 40 may not have have reached their sort of c-suite peak for example or, or the, the the ceiling of their career they're still on a on a journey for for me i look at it and think without this without uh, um the 40 under 40 um and and maybe there's a, a a you know ideal suits everyone um catchphrase out there that that could replace it but for now that allows um individuals who perhaps see their career path within the organization that they're in, but it might be still another five or six years off, not because they lack the talent, but simply because the generation above them needs to move on. 
in order for them to progress to to the roles that they want. So it's great when the industry then offers some of our younger people the opportunity to go seeking that recognition outside of the business without any detriment to their current role and and for them to go and overachieve and overexert themselves in in other areas and promote themselves, which is beneficial for the company as well. So um, most awards, uh, it's set up to be for a single person. So, you know, you can put a lot of work in if you're promoting yourself or or if you're going to um, nominate someone else and then you know your your odds are not not that great when it's a a single prize and then so really I guess what what we need is perhaps just more Um, 40 under 40 can stay and is there a version of um, you know you can't be in the C-suite or you can't be in these you know non-managers recognized 100 non-managers recognized or or similar Um, more recognition is 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 needed, not less. I totally agree with that. Um, and I think one thing that makes the AV industry so interesting and so unique is how much history and how deep the relationships are. Um, when I first joined the industry, I'm like, man, how am I ever going to fit in? These guys have known each other 20 years. But to see see that it's attainable for people that are younger, it almost gives a sense of hope to someone considering joining the industry. You don't have to have those deep rooted 20 year relationships. We can keep the industry fresh, build our own relationships too. And of course, rely on those deep rooted relationships um, for us to learn, right? So I think I think it's definitely something that's important to focus on. Um, I do like the idea of perhaps non-managers. I think that's great. Um, Or different smaller uh, user groups, Andrew, but I think you hit the nail on the head, Jenny. Recognition can't stop. It's what what inspires people to move forward and to be the best that they can be. I think I would be remiss not to mention, Jenny, in, in the conversations I've had with uh, with your you know, organizational colleague, Chris Netto, he likes to tie things into the professional wrestling world. He may have told this to you before. He says, every organization needs to find their undertaker, someone who's going to put them in the spotlight, make them famous. He said, and if we can make the person in HR the undertaker, if we can make the person in marketing the undertaker, that's to the betterment of the organization. So he wants everyone to be a superstar, pun intended. Um, And I I think that's kind of what you're saying, that we need to find our organization's superstars, their key players, the people who are overachieving, and not just have it be known within the C-suite or by the water cooler in that organization, but throughout the industry. Say, this is a person who you should know, you should network with, you should try to seek out because they're special. Mm -hmm. Absolutely agree. I think also, you know, there's, there's something quite special about being recognized by industry and not necessarily by your employer. Um, you you can get into a, a cycle of sort of being over motivational and over rewarding and so on. And then it loses that um, sort of specialty and, and you say, oh, OK, well, it's my turn now, isn't it? Because I haven't had it for the last four to five weeks. But when it's industry, especially when it's a nomination process, um, that that's really going to help people. And, and it you know, elevates them. It looks good. It inspires the next generation to go, actually, I I might want to achieve that too. um, And I'm going to stick around a bit longer to to do that. And I feel like, Jenny, it takes it from an appreciation from your company to an honor, right? And those are two very different things. And I think both are important. So let me ask you this about the idea of of motivating people in general. Now that you have been recognized, again, it's not not by yourselves, but by peers and colleagues who nominated you, recognized as influencers, recognized as superstars. Do you feel like you have a certain responsibility now, either within your organization, within the industry? Is there a a new benchmark you need to set for yourself as an influencer or as someone who's kind of a, a representative of our industry, of our craft and trade? Or would you not think of it that way? I think, I think, it, yeah, um, I would think of it that way, but I don't think that I would limit it to people in my organization or even, you know, um, younger people that, that potentially are looking to me as, as a mentor. Um, I've been trying to uh, actively 
watch and seek out fellow podcasters and, and content creators and make sure that I'm giving them the level of support that I'd like to receive back for the content that myself and Chris put out um, and some of the stuff that I put out myself and so on. So I think that comes with the territory. Once you've been recognized, go help that other person to um, get recognized, to get followed, et cetera. Um, and, and, uh, and, and also make those introductions to um, some of the, you know, content creators in our industry as well to, to collaborate because that just adds extra dimensions to the content we're putting out. And then that helps everyone. Yeah, I think uh, I, I'm sure a lot of people feel this way, not just the uh, uh, the three of us on this call, but I think a lot of the reason why many of us were probably part of this is that we already held ourselves to a, a, a higher standard internally. Uh, we're probably hard on ourselves. We're probably people that um, are, are always looking over our, our own work to make sure it's better and that we all hold ourselves to be a role model to others because that's probably a, a big reason why we were able to get to such a level of being thought of as an influencer. So if we continue that, I think that's probably the most that we can ask each other of is keep continuing to hold yourself to be a role model to others and hopefully build out this influencer community as much as we can. I, I wanted to ask, uh, as far as kind of seeding the next generation of commercial AV professionals, obviously people are going to, to look to you potentially as, as mentors or role models, but I think we also need to build out a more intentional pipeline of people into our industry. So many people, even you know, 40 under 40 influencers I've spoken to in previous podcasts have said things like, oh, I was in one industry, I happened to fall into commercial AV. It's almost like we accidentally benefit from their talents because they they didn't intend to find us. Are there ways you would suggest collectively to find us more intentionally and more deliberately and therefore kind of protect our future? I, my, my big take on that is, is continuing to look outside of our own industry, kind of what you're referring to, Dan, is, um, you know, what, what are other industries doing that uh, is, is doing so well, right? Like we, we talked about what the AV industry does so great is that we always have the greatest technology, right? No one doubts that. Uh, everybody walks around any of our industry trade shows and thinks that's the coolest piece of uh, technology. I want that in my home. I want that in my office. Totally agreed. But where can we improve? And I think a lot of that we can find from um, a lot of the bigger tech players out there that maybe hold their own larger trade shows, like a Microsoft, like a Salesforce. Um, you know, what are they doing differently within those individual industries in the software space? And really, I think what we can find is that a lot of these other industries is they're making a greater push towards software. How can they make hardware better through the use of software? Um, how does the cloud come into play here? Uh, how does the cloud affect the AV industry? And, and these types of different uh, spaces and technologies and companies that live in these different worlds, that's where we can really start to not just learn from what they've done differently, but also the, the talent pool that lives in that space. Because a lot of the times, um, I know even when I was in school, and I'm sure uh, Jenny and Cassie too, when they were in school, you know, a lot of times when you think of, you know, if I'm going to go to a technology company, the first thing you think of are the Microsofts and the Salesforce of the world um, because they're front and center. So how can we take some of that and put that in the AV world and put that in front of mind of a lot of the kids in university that are looking to come out and join the tech space? And those tech companies they think of are actually the companies within the AV industry. I think that's one big thing that at least I, I know that I've noticed myself, uh, just even speaking with the younger generation, uh, as well as just walking around the trade shows and thinking how we can change and get better and continue to move this industry forward is, is looking at what others do better and how we can get more in the front of the mind of uh, the youngest talent out there coming out of school. 100% couldn't agree more. Yeah, we, I, we, we need to get to the schools, right? So that that that's the difference. I mean, even more so here in the UK. So um in in many of our schools, um, we we wouldn't really have the level of theater or stage or sports that you might see in some of the US schools. So um, this sort of AV technician as such with the involvement in audio and lighting, even those guys aren't really discovering any of that unless they're musicians or they want to go into theater, um, but they haven't really had any hands-on experience. But the at least in that area, I think that you you do naturally end up finding yourself in tech. Um, we have a, a lot of ex-musicians in our industry um, that are working in the live event space. But when it comes to our largest now vertical across the industry being in the corporate market, um, what are we doing with those people? We, 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 they come up through school, 
maybe they go down a graphics and, and media route, maybe they go down an, an IT software DevOps route. Um, but at no stage are we in front of them saying, hi, we're the people that do the commercial version. We're the people that are doing, um, making your graphics look great. And and when we're just not in front of them. Um, and then in, in many parts of the world, we're not in front of them at a university level either. Um, I, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know how many of us need to run the sort of outreach programs, but we, we almost need to be running around cool installs, sticking a label on it, going, this is AV, ring this number if you like it. <laughs> we'll put Dan's number on all the installs. For <laughs> Call Dan if you like what you see. There you go. Um, I think I totally agree with both of you. I think it's important that when we run across an individual who is the right person, that we bring them into the industry. Um, I know when I was applying for the job that I have now, it required experience and they kind of took a chance on me. You know, maybe we can mold her to be what we need to be. And I think that that's a, a really good recipe to find someone that can stick long-term in this industry, not just this industry, but really any industry is finding the person and not relying so heavily on the experience, right? So I know that that was definitely a fear of mine when I was in college applying for jobs. I'm like, that one requires 10 years, that one requires five years. Um, and it just, it's, it's giving someone that chance that they gave us, right? Yeah, this is true Super. high tech, right? I mean, like, that, that, that's what I tried to get across too, to when I'm hiring um, uh, anyone that's going to need to join the company. And even in, in, in my company at Excite, right, we're, we're very industry agnostic. We, of course, focus greatly on this AV industry. Uh, that's where, of course, my knowledge lives and my background lives and our founder's background lives. And the reason why we did that also was because this is true high tech. The other industries, look, that's tech. But if you cut your teeth in this industry, the rest of the world is opened up for you. So we've been going about 25 minutes or so just to kind of button up the podcast. The last question I have kind of holds as its backdrop, this idea of the great resignation we've been hearing about for the last 12 months or so. We've been hearing less about it lately, but certainly we heard about it quite a bit toward the beginning of this year. Um, what is your feeling collectively about how organizations can retain talents like yourselves? Obviously, uh, you know everyone wants to hang on to their high performers, but if you're a high performer, you're probably going to be in demand. You're going to have a certain profile for yourself. What can organizations do to hang on to people like you so that you want to stay part of that team? I think the first step, and this is probably the most intuitive, but people often miss it is to ask, ask your key employees, what's important to you? What do you love about this job? What are you struggling with this job? Um, is it the flexibility? Is it the pay? And here's the thing, there's no one answer that fits every employee. So I think it's really important for management and C-level execs to sit down and say, what's keeping you here? And how can we continue that? Because if we're not investing, like you said, people will come knocking and the last thing you want is to lose um, someone so valuable, right? Yeah, asking is huge, right? It, so many, so I've seen so it happen too many times, but employers make the assumption that, oh, you know, everyone wants to work at home. That's not the case. I'm here in an office. I, I see Cassie's at an office and Jenny may be home, right? Because we all have different needs and wants and things that motivate us. Pay, maybe pay isn't as important to some people versus titles and flexibility uh, and benefits or, or power. Uh, so agree, Cassie, huge. Asking what motivates you and using that to keep your uh, top talent is massive. And I think being flexible, I mean, Andrew, I'm, I'm, I'm home, but it's 8 p.m. here too. So it's, uh, <laughs> <Good point. laughs> I'm home and it's dark. Um, but I think that uh, we, we cannot underestimate what the pandemic has done, right? So um, any life-changing event changes how you feel about yourself. When, when my son was born, we had uh, some time in the neonatal unit because he wasn't very well. And I left questioning if my job was even a real job because what I'd witnessed that week were these nurses and doctors and quite frankly wizards um, working their magic and, and doing something that felt so profound that I left thinking I, I need to go and do something that that saves lives I can't carry on and gradually that you know subsided and I'm still here in AV and 
there's a, 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 a you know a smaller version of that that I think has happened because of the pandemic. We we had to go home. We had to spend more time at home, families, and so on. And I, I just think that we've all done a bit of soul searching. Um, we we've been through a big event. We've um, maybe been able to spend a bit more time with our nearest and dearest, and we've questioned a lot of things about life. So, yes, it, it, I, I would say to a, to an employer. Don't take it personally. Um, these people are simply saying, wow, I didn't realize how long I've just been doing the same thing day in, day out. And for my own mental health, maybe I need a change. But that change can be within the organization. And sometimes I think that's where companies go wrong. Um, absolutely asking is the starting point. And then where might you like to be? Even if you might like to just be there for a year, so that you can refine your own motivation. If these people were good, then they can always be good, you know, and, and um, quiet quitters seems to be the, the phrase that's out there a lot at the moment. And I think that that isn't necessarily someone that's you know, given up and should necessarily just go. I just think they need to refine themselves and that vigor because we're all still a bit tired out, right? Following, following COVID and, and what it did to us all. Um, and we've, yeah, we, we've soul searched and, and, and maybe we just need to have a little go at something different, even if it is just within our organization. And then we'll either return or we'll find a new path and flourish. I agree with you. I think COVID gave us all different perspective. And like you said, we are reprioritizing what's important. And to every single employee, it could be something different. So I think it's, I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, I, I even felt it myself during COVID that I felt guilty for not being as operationally involved in the business as I could be. I envied, you know, the the, the finance staff. I'm like, oh, you're 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 crisis managing. You you know, you're 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 like the heroes right now. I want to be a hero, but I'm not an accountant. What do I do with that? Um, and it, but it but it does, and and. Anyone else who's felt like that will probably be saying, do you know what? I, I want to be in that role. I loved what they got to do. Or I liked that they were essential staff. I liked that they saved us, whatever it is. Um, I just think we maybe I've heard a lot of customers, manufacturers, you know, uh, competitors take heaving big size and like, oh, this is a nightmare. Everyone's just leaving. No, I, I don't think it is. I think it's no one's fault. It it was going to happen after such a major event. Um, and if you have the space, see if they can do something different within your organization to refine that motivation. Well, I feel like this has been a really illuminating conversation. Thank you so much, Jenny and Cassie and Andrew for sharing so willingly your insights and your perspectives and sometimes about kind of thorny issues about employee, uh, employee retention and uh, you know whether we have an intentional pathway into our industry. I appreciate your candor and I appreciate your perspective. And I, I'd like to you know thank you uh, not only for being part of the AV Plus podcast this week, but also for all you do uh, and you were nominated by your peers and colleagues for a reason. So thank you for being here. Thank you for all that you do. And thank you for educating us. Thank, thank you, Dan. 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 So happy to have been joined today by Andrew Gross, who is VP of Sales with Excite, Cassie Wells, who is Corporate Sales Manager with CCS Presentation Systems, and Jenny Hicks, who is Group Head of Technology with Midwich Group. My name is Dan Farisi, Editor-in-Chief with Commercial Integrator. Please check back each and every Friday for a new edition of the AV Plus Podcast. Just go to commercialintegrator.com to get your fix of our latest episode. We'll be continuing with our 40 Under 40 series for the next couple of weeks as we include just about every one of our influencers on the list. Once again, thank you for tuning in to AV Plus and have a great rest of the day.